Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So we've been talking this week about the current state of the condo market. And uh, last night I had uh, a really interesting um, sort of numerical, mathematical, uh, economic analysis of uh, the current condo market. And so I thought that it would be really interesting to chat with a practitioner. Uh, and I uh, ran across uh, Susan Tuflin, who uh, used to be called the condo queen. And uh, and she's um, posted a couple of things lately about how she stopped selling pre-construction condos a couple of years ago. And I wanted to find out why uh, and what's happened with the market. So uh, welcome, uh, Susan Tuflin, to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute honor. So you first started your real estate career working for a prominent developer along the waterfront, I understand, uh, Concord City Place. And you had an 18-year career uh, where you assisted and guided hundreds of investors and end users with real estate uh, investments. You were featured in Toronto Life Magazine as one of the most influential female realtors in the pre-construction space. And in 19, in, sorry, 19, 2015, you listed the city's fourth most expensive condo in the city for 12.8 million. I'd love to yeah, see that. Uh, I'd love to see the pictures of the photos from that condo. That right, yeah. And you were called therefore the Toronto Condo Queen. Um, but today you provide value and services to past clients in different areas. I do. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Absolutely. So tell me, tell me what's the state of the pre-construction condo market today? Um, it's a bit topsy-turvy if you want to know the truth. I mean, the reality is, is that there are so many things that are creating such a conundrum in the space. Like, for instance, um, interest rates, you know, had rose seven consecutive times and you know now like development charges have almost doubled so it's it it puts quite a bit of pressure on developers to build affordably and profitably so i mean how does the city expect devel developers to forge ahead and build these things if they can't build with a profit right um, the ones that are surviving have essentially land banked and they've had years and years of experience, you know, the Tridels and the Menkees of the world. And, you know, they have deeper pockets and so they can still kind of forge ahead and build. But a lot of them are sort of just, you know, they're sinking for lack of a better word. So the, the developers uh, are sinking. The developers are sink sinking. And unless the government doesn't step in and somehow subsidize this whole industry, it's going to go belly up, essentially. You yeah. think the whole development business could go belly up? Seriously? Well, I mean, that's what it, well, there was one I, I saw this, you know, quote by a gentleman. I can't remember who it was, but he said that um, there's billions in unrealized losses in the condo market. Right. And, and it's right. He's right. Because 81 um, percent of condos that are per, like 81 percent of, you know, um, purchasers rather in the last several years are now cash flow negative. So 81 percent of the people who have bought in the condo market in the last, I don't know, several years are all negative cash flow producing. What that means essentially is that you buy a condo and you're dipping into your own pocket to absorb the carrying costs. So there's maintenance, there's taxes, there's mortgage. And if you're lucky, you break even on that with a tenant. But if you don't, then you are obliged to dip into your pocket and pay the difference, the delta, right? So the reality is, is that there are so many people, you know, in this scenario. That coupled with the fact that a lot of people gambled and they pulled money or equity out of their homes to make these type of purchases, right? Through a HELOC. So they had quite a bit of equity. In some cases, they're, you know, older couple, maybe, you know, they're, you know, pre-retirement and they go out and they take these loans with the premise of, you know, securing these investment properties. And now that the market has flipped and we all know how leverage works, like it works, you know, in both directions, you know, these people are in deep doo-doo for lack what's, of a what's... better What's a HELOC? Um, so it's a home equity line of credit. So, and you so people are using these home equity line of credits, you think, to uh, borrow against the security in their own home such that they could make uh, investments in the deposits of pre-construction condos. 
Correct. And that's how they were guided by a lot of agents. I personally have never advised anyone to take money out of their home. What I would advise someone to do if they are looking to invest is take money out of a secondary home, right? Not your principal residence, because in the event that you fall short and you just can't, you know, the, the payments are not made on the second property, then you can you can sell that property. You don't live in the property. But I never advise anyone to take money out of their principal residence to make an investment purchase, even renovate, truth be told. Like I, I'm I'm very conservative in nature. And I feel that the agents that push clients to purchase multiple investments using their principal residence are not forthcoming. And the reality is is a lot of people are not just going to lose their investments, but they're, you know, they're looking to lose their principal residence. I right. saw you post on a LinkedIn post this past weekend. I think exactly this that 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 you thought that uh, that it was wrong, unethical, really, uh, for uh, for some of these agents to push people into uh, making these you know numerous different investments in pre construction condos using their home equity line of credits to do so. And you said you got out of that um, business three years ago uh, because you didn't feel comfortable with that. Is that is that correct? Well, it wasn't just not feeling comfortable. It was just knowing where the market was headed. I mean, if several properties, several buildings are, you know, coming up and they're just negative cash flow producing and the cost of purchasing is rising, like in some cases downtown, you're looking at $2,000 a square foot to purchase a condo. Now, if you're not living in that condo or your intent is not to own it for a good, you know, 10 year time horizon, it's not a good idea to purchase it as an investment. I've said this time and again to several investors and they don't listen. So they'll go and they'll, you know, purchase with another agent, even after I told them my honest truth about why I think they shouldn't do it. And, you know, they put themselves in this predicament. So I just feel like, it's an aggregate prop. I don't think we like the tsunami hasn't really hit yet. I think that there's going to be an inf if you look at the assignment market, for instance, like there are boards, private boards where you can go to Facebook, you know, some of these platforms and you will see a litany of assignments for sale and everyone's just foregoing their deposits, foregoing everything because they just want to get out. You see, because the reality is, is that because of the shift in the market, a lot of these condos are not valued at what's what they once were. And so the appraisals are falling short. Like the banks are coming and saying, no, 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 your your house, your condo is not worth 700000 It's worth five fifty. dollars So you come up with the difference. So now what? Now you have to go out and find a private investor, a private, uh, a private lender. So now you're having to spend 10, 12% on the difference. And... Good so luck you think, you think yeah. there's a coming tsunami coming? We got to take a break for some messages and come sure. back. And I'm going to ask you about this coming tsunami because okay. lots of people think it's bad now, but you think it's going to get worse. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes, we're talking with the condo queen, or at least the former condo queen, about the current state of the condo business in uh, the greater Toronto area. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. Our topic tonight is the uh, construction, pre-construction condo business or the condo business uh, today uh, for these uh, condos that were bought as pre-construction condos, but now have either been completed or are in the process of being completed. Our guest is the former condo queen, uh, so uh, so named by Toronto Life and some other magazines, uh, um, Susan Tuflian, uh, who- yes, sir. Uh, who is really quite a practical expert. Um, and she spent 18 years in uh, the condo um, business, the condo real estate sales business. She started her real estate career in 2006. She is one of the very first successful women in the pre-construction space. And uh, and it's a pleasure to to have you on with us. Uh, Thank you. So let's talk about this coming tsunami. So So what you're describing is a situation where people have been investing in pre-construction condos. And you're saying, number one, that they were investing at prices that were high. You quoted $2,000 a square foot. That's a really high price, but it but, is. Uh, but high prices. And then what they were doing is they were getting these deposits that I understand start out at 5%, but over time become about 20% of the price of the condo. Uh, 
by borrowing against their home equity lines of credit, against their principal residences. Uh, and they're doing it more than once. They're doing it a few times. Exactly. And, uh, and now those condos are being delivered for occupancy and they've got to show up with the balance of the money. And what you're saying is the appraisals don't come out. Uh, the bank appraisals don't come out at the prior purchase price. They're lower. Right. And the banks are either refusing to provide the money or are saying we'll provide the money, but a lower amount. So you got to come up with a difference. And so people are either not closing, I guess, uh, and or are closing, but closing by way of going to the, the private lending market at far higher interest rates to get the difference between the old appraisal and the current appraisal, the old purchase price, less the deposit to the current uh, amount of money that they've got to give to the, uh, to the, to the, to the developer, less the amount of bank financing. And you're saying this is going to be a tsunami. Why is it going to be a tsunami? Well, because the condo market initially started as, you know, just it was with the premise of, you know, you purchase a home for your living, like you you move into it, it's for your own private use. But then what ended up happening, it, it, there was some sort of sort of paradigm shift where everybody just decided, oh, like, this is a great opportunity to make you know, an investment out of it. So everybody and their grandmother bought several properties. There were no caps and everybody bought properties with the premise of renting it out. That's all it was. It was just like rent out, rent out. It wasn't for personal use. Okay. So the reality is, is that, okay, like, let's just, I mean, if you, let's just take a, you know, one-off case study. If you yourself own a home and, you know, at the height of this whole interest rate hike, some people were paying, you know, north of $6,000 a month in mortgage payments alone. So if you're looking at mortgage, taxes, you know, your, I don't know, like everything else associated with a, a home expense, coupled with the shortfall of you having to pay for the carrying cost of your own investment properties, so what are people really paying? Like you're paying like, I don't know, 8,000 a month in like living expenses for your own home. And then because there's a shortfall on your tenants, you know, rent and you can't really hike, there are, you know, certain restrictions for hiking, right? So now you've got to cover an extra $500, $800 a month on, do you see what I'm saying? And yeah. this is on an aggregate level if you can imagine. So it's not like a one-off one, two, three people. This is like- so you think there's lots of people that have made these Oh, absolutely. Hundreds of people. Now, this coupled with the mortgage fraud, okay? I'm There, there are certain communities, and I'm not going to name them, but there are certain communities that feel like it's okay to commit bank fraud, truthfully. And they have spiked- Well, isn't that what the, Donald Trump got 34 felony convictions for? your guess is mine i think it was something else too but it was like fraud and some other like but anyway but donald trump is you know privy never to mind it. never mind D yeah topic. right exactly so, so you're i mean saying that the there's some people that think that and so explain what the bank fraud is that you and think even ron butler do. mentioned it in his i mean he's a very uh knowledgeable individual as well like i i've gained a lot of insight from his stuff but the reality is, is that um you know a lot of people took it like they faked mortgage commitment letters they faked income they forged, you know, bank documents, all sorts. And it just goes undetected. Like it literally- To do what? Just, to get loans or to, to get purchase agreements with uh, developers? To both. Like to get the initial bypass of a mortgage pre-approval, right? You need a pre-approval in order to secure- a condo within the 10 day framework. So you, you, you know, you basically purchase a home, you got 10 days to decide whether you want the pre-construction home or not. And then within that 10 day time horizon, you have to submit a pre-approval. Okay. Those pre-approvals were fraudulent. So some guy's telling the developer, yeah, yeah, this guy's okay to go ahead. Meanwhile, he doesn't have the money for it. So he just part purchased the so home. Why didn't the developers check up on people? I don't, that's, that's between you and the developer. I have no idea because, you know, uh, when, when you really think about it, developers are hungry too. And in order for them to forge ahead with the build, they need 70%, those sales. yeah, 70% of the, the, the sales have to be met in order to sort of proceed with, with, uh, you know, with building the, the, the building. So I don't know, like, 
So on some of these people, this is the whole problem. This is one of the whole problem is that really truthfully, this industry is not regulated from the development side, from the real estate agent side. You know, although we have an association, they don't really regulate and it's causing such a big thing. So. So you're saying that there were some real estate agents, maybe unscrupulous, maybe just aggressive that were persuading a lot of people to borrow against their homes to uh, invest in pre-construction condos because prices are always going up. And so you might as well, you know, put down 5% that'll end up being 20%. And by the time you buy your condo or the condo gets delivered and you have to come up with uh, the money, more than likely it'll go have gone up by 10 or 20%. And so therefore you'll effectively make 100% on your money in the intervening couple of years. And then you'll be able to uh, borrow at, uh, you know, 1.5 or 2% and rent it out for a profit. And yet things turned out differently that uh, instead of. Well, that's just it, because leverage works in both directions. Like explain that. You know, it's that, it's all fun and games until it turns right. Like because the, uh, the idea of securing money was so cheap because rates were so low, everybody and their grandmother was taking out money. There was an influx of, you know, money floating around. Right. And so, you know, now that things have turned and the rates were rising at one point, um, it's creating such a burden on people because people didn't anticipate it. You know, I don't think a lot of people were in the market in 2008 when the subprime market went, you know, like went the other way. But mind you, in 2008, that just impacted the United States, really didn't have a real impact here. OK, but because of the cumulative effect of everything happening in the market right now, I humbly believe, and I don't know, am I an expert? Who knows? I just read a lot. I'm well read that I think that there is going to be a substantial loss. And I read somewhere like on LinkedIn that one thing that could happen is that, you know, hedge funds and REITs and pension funds could come in and secure these, you know, homes or these condos after construction defaults and then just switch them over into apartment buildings. So like, will that happen? Who knows? Because that's obviously, you know, you need deep pockets for things like that as well. But at the moment, like, I just, I don't see, I mean, I, I'm really well, I have good friends. I have friends that are, prominent developers and I speak to them on the daily and I had one developer say to me that at the moment almost 40 percent of the homeowners are defaulting on their on their co condos in his particular development so almost can you 40 like percent of the 41 percent that was the number 41 41 percent yeah. of of people that <clears throat> have, are supposed to show up with a check to buy their condo uh, or at least the 80 percent that they haven't paid for yet um, on the occupancy day are defaulting that's right so, so what's this is, what's the developer going to do sue them all yeah. well they can sue one of two things they retain the deposit and they decide to sue but i mean how many people are, like you have 300 units in a building or whatever like you're going to sue all 300 people how's that going to work or whatever 40 percent of 300 i mean it's just that I don't want to make it look like a dire, you know, doomsday thing, but I feel like there needs to be ca caution in the wind. So in other words, like there, there is things that are happening. I mean, that also coupled with the fact that, for instance, like the unemployment is rising, which is part and parcel why, you know, um, the bank decided to cut rates, right? Because inflation dropped, unemployment rose, and they just thought it was a good idea to drop another quarter point. But, um, you know, like housing starts aren't happening because of all the restrictions. Like, the, like think about the logic. They bring in a million people and we can't even construct homes that fast. Housing starts at, our, 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 at an all-time low. Right. New condo sales are the lowest that they've been in 27 years. The lowest so, they've been in 27 years. Correct. Correct. 3,159 units sold in the first half of 2024. That's like really low. And what and, and what you're saying, what would be typical? About 40,000, I'd say. So, so you're saying sales volume is off by 70, 80 percent? Correct. Correct. And um, 
I mean, it's just, it's just, it's a cumulative thing like that. Okay. Here's another thing that we should take note of or take heed of the other day, over 40 banks collapsed in the, in China. Like they just like literally disappeared. Like nobody could access their money kind of thing. So you don't think that all these Chinese investors, because let's not kid ourselves, it's heavily weighed on like certain groups like Chinese and Indians and so forth. You don't think these people have an impact across the sea? Like you don't think some of these people have funds that are tied up in banks, in, in Chinese banks? 40 banks collapsed in China, right? That, that's the other thing about real estate agents is that they, they're they not global. They don't think global picture. We're in the midst of a World War III. I mean, this is another thing. Like, I mean, we all, I don't want to get into that, but like, there's a lot going on. It's a cumulative thing. And all this obviously is going to have an impact on our dollar and everything else. And I feel like certain agents just have blinders. Like they just sell because they just think that our country does not is not impacted by any other country in the world. And that's not true. That's well, not true. They, you know, they want to make some money, I guess. And if people sure. are interested in, uh, in, in, in buying, um, whether it's a good investment or not, um, you know, their obligation, I guess, is to, to, to do the deal. Um, now you're, you're very ethical that you told them when you thought it was a bad transaction and advised against it. Um, maybe not everyone, advises against it uh, and just does the deal when someone wants to do the deal. I want to preface this by, well, I want to sort of stress it by saying that there are certain asset classes that I'm okay with. Like for instance, detached homes and townhomes, I still think are, you know, exceptional value simply because they've always been the, um, you know, the, uh, which we call the holy grail, if you will, of like home purchasing. So if you're if you have the cash and you can buy a detached home with the premise of living in it for a few years, then I don't have a problem selling that to you. Right. I, I wouldn't have a problem selling you that asset. But me personally, I don't find value in high rise anymore just because um, I don't think a lot of them will even manifest like without you know like there's certain buildings that have that have sold and some of them like we were talking about in 2012 like they were just initiated so that's almost like 10 you know 12 years ago so and they were just sold and i just feel like it's going to take another 12 10 to 12 years for it to build i mean i i don't know like i i don't have a crystal ball i can just um obviously we can determine things based on you know, the information that we get, the intel that we have, and just take it from there. But I so personally... Let me, let, me, let me ask you, I apologize for interrupting, but let me ask you, if 41% of this developer who you spoke with of their purchasers are not closing, and you're saying it's 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 going to be too challenging for them to sue all of those people, what are they going to do? Their, their construction loan is coming due. They haven't yet made a profit because probably they've still got some of their units that they haven't sold yet, that that typically the developer makes the profit on the last 10 or 20% of the units. Um, are they going to default? On well, the they just go, they essentially go into receivership, right? I don't know. I don't know what happens at that point from a, you know, because I've never dealt on that side of things, but they essentially, I mean, look at the one condos downtown, the Sam Mizrahi project, he went into receivership. He's now funding it on his own, I heard. That's what I heard. But it was a multi-billion dollar investment. And I mean, I don't want to, so this is all allegations, okay? Because I know I'm getting recorded. It's 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 alleged that he's being sued by multiple people, like, because everything just kind of fell apart. So. So you're, you're saying that you think that some of these developers could default on the the bank loans, the construction oh, loans, because a whole bunch of the purchasers don't show up for closing and that therefore there would be more developers that could end up in receivership. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. So if this you don't a, have- This is a scary scenario. It is because if you don't have deep pockets and you haven't been around for like years and years, like I said, some of the robust type companies like Tridel and I'm less- like leery about Tridel and Menkes and some of these ones that, you know, have just been around for several over 80 years because, you know, they, 
they have vertical integration too, which essentially means that a lot of their stuff is done in-house, even the construction. So some of these developers- is that, is, I apologize again for interrupting, but isn't that a risk as well? If they're vertically integrated, and then they've got a whole bunch of, they've got a construction company and a whole bunch of construction workers, they need to, to keep feeding the beast, don't they? And so therefore they've got to start new construction. They got to start new condos. They got to sell more pre-construction condos right now in a really crappy market. How do they keep the process going? They forge ahead and they are they remain successful. The problem lies in the fact that now their market share has sort of shrunk in the sense that only super rich people, if you will, or people can who can afford, you know, units north of like 2000 a square foot or 1500 a square foot, especially downtown are making these type of purchases where they're getting their money. I have no idea. Okay. Like, well, let's, let's, honest... let, let's take a break for some messages to come sure. back. And I'm going to ask you, you know, what, what's going to happen to some of these investors and, uh, and what do you think caused this? And, and what do you think the, the, the future scenario is stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in just two minutes. We're talking about the condo business, which is in a crash today. And uh, and Susan's talking about it becoming a tsunami. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Susan Tufflin, uh, Tufflian about uh, who's who's been reputed to be the condo queen and had a big spread in Toronto life at one point in time about being one of the most influential female realtors in the pre-construction condo space. Um, she's got an 18-year career span in the real estate business. And we're talking about the condo crash, a tsunami coming that's uh, going to be even more impactful. Uh, but I got to go back, Susan, and ask you about this uh, $12.8 million condo that you sold. Where was it? Oh, sorry. It was at the museum house. Where's that? On Avenue Road, just across the street from, you know, the uh, the museum, essentially. On the um, top floor? Penthouse? Yeah, on the top floor. How many top. rooms? Um, You know what? It was a shell unit at the time. And so here's the story behind that. Basically, we had sold X amount of units for a particular developer, like over 120 units for a developer. And he thought we were so incredible that he was like, I'm going to give you this unit. It was his, it was the developer's unit, essentially. And we got the listing that way because we just were incredibly driven and just selling. And was it a domestic buyer or an international buyer? So... The I got the listing, but I didn't actually sell the unit. So, but here's the thing. I met some incredible people. Like I met some NBA players. I met a gentleman who was ordained sir. Um, and I met a lady who was actually very, very prominent in the area, like in, in the whole um, Yorkville area. And she actually gave me one of her listings as a result of that listing. So it kind of just kind of was a multiplier effect. So did I sell the 12.8 at that time? No, I did not, but I did have the listing. So there you go. Fantastic. Um, what's the most expensive condo sold in Toronto, do you think? The most expensive condo sold in Toronto. Yeah, ever, other than the 12.8. Is there another one higher? There is, most likely, maybe in the 20 millions. Um, off the top of my head, I, I don't know. Like, because it's just ever changing. So I don't know. I can't answer that. So you were quoting 2000 bucks a square foot. I'm told that, uh, you know, that, you know, 2000 or 1900 might be in one or two condos. Um, but, uh, just the very high end that most of the condos are sold sort of between 1200 and 1400 bucks a square foot. So let's, let's just use a thousand to make the numbers easier. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what's the average size? It's less than a thousand square feet today. Correct. The size of the unit you're saying. Yeah. Oh, it's much less than that. So, so I mean, we're looking at seven hundred. Okay, so seven hundred times a thousand is seven hundred thousand. Yeah. And so therefore, they've got to come up. Uh, the the owner's got to come up with twenty percent over time. So they've got to come up with one hundred forty thousand um, uh, bucks. You know, day one five percent, and then over time, the balance of the fifteen percent. Uh, so they're in for one hundred forty thousand. And so uh, on uh, on closing, they got to come in with. 700 minus 140,000 or 560,000 bucks. And you're saying that the current values are less than that. Um, and so therefore they're losing their deposit. So they're walking away from $140,000 
And, and maybe they've done this more than once because you're saying that they've done a few condos. Yeah. Um, and or if they close, they've got to close on the hundred they got to close on some amount. You're saying if the the five sixty that they were supposed to come up with, um, they were going to get from the bank, they can only get call it four hundred now. So they got to come up with one hundred sixty thousand in uh, in private debt that is more expensive. Right, the delta. So not only do they have to like, so you know, um, they have to secure the funds, like the difference, and then chances are the bank won't lend it to them. Well, they don't lend it to them because the appraisal falls short. So now they're like panicking on some of these platforms, asking people for money, and um, the rates are much higher, right? So if 81% of the pre-construction condos and other condos are cash flow negative, and I've lost 160 thousand bucks 170 thousand bucks already and then on the balance i'm paying what what's a private lender 10 percent, 12 percent 12 percent. it really depends on the position you're in like if you're 12 12 percent like on yeah. on another call it 150 160 thousand bucks um and then on the balance i'm paying a high interest rate on to the bank and i'm cash flow negative yeah and i've done this what Two times, five times, three, ten three times? times. Yeah, some people have ten times. Like some people have quite a bit of units. Like they just took out, you know. That's why there were all these protests at one point with. Um, oh, I'm just falling short of the names here, but there were some developers that just wouldn't let people out of their agreements. Right? They were like, "No, this is what you paid for it," which is what they want essentially, because now that the market is flipped, they are you know standing in lines and protesting, and they want their money back. But um, it becomes a case of like, will the developer you know let them out, or will they be you know will they this sue is, them? This is going to hurt a lot of people. <clears throat> it will. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, and it's also going to hurt a lot of real estate brokers because. The, I, I think the way you described it is the real estate broker gets the majority of their fee only on closing, correct? Correct. Well, that's it. Okay. So that brings me to another really interesting point. So you're paid in tiers. And before, and so a while ago, there was no such thing as a clawback. So the developer would just pay you your commission up front, irrespective of whether or not the, the unit closed. But because there were so much units that were in default at one point, the developer was like, they started this whole thing program where it was like, no, 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 we are now going to get you to sign a clawback. And what that essentially is, is that if if the 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 um, the purchaser did not close, then you have to forfeit your commission and you have to pay back the entire commission. Which so, makes sense because you actually didn't sell it. Well, because the guy didn't close on it. So right. now you're. Yeah. And so, the whole and the other the whole you know thing about the the whole joke about all this is that n the the industry is not really regulated. I mean, there's no real you know entity or institution you can go to to say, hey, this is happening. Can you help me? Can I get my money back? Like it's just it's one big conundrum, and the government has to step in to somehow regulate this in a way without you know carrying a heavy hand on it as well. But it's just if if they don't do something about it, it's just going to get worse and worse. Now, I'm told you may know better than I, um, but I'm told that 80 percent of the money in the real estate business is made by 20 percent of the brokers. And so, therefore, there's got to be a whole bunch of brokers that don't make a lot of money. If they all of a sudden are subject to a bunch of clawbacks, can they afford it? Your guess is as good as that's why I stopped selling pre-construction condos like years ago. <laughs> it didn't make financial sense for me. Like at one point we were holding seminars and educating clients and we actually sold a ton of pre-construction units. And hence, that's why I got the name. I was sort of coined affectionately condo queen because everybody would just come to me for units back in the day. Um, and then what ended up happening was because of the influx of realtors coming into the market as well. Now Realtors were doing what they refer to as co-oping. So if you can't get into, here's another thing. If you can't get into a building because you don't have a strong relationship with the builder, then you have to come through me. So I take a cut of your commission, right? Like you can't just go to the builder 
if you don't have a relationship with the builder, you got to call an agent and go, Hey, do you have access into this building? Oh, you do? Because my client needs in and I'll give you a portion of commission. But what was happening? So all these people were coming to me and I was getting sick and tired of all the co-oping because what ends up happening is that if the building doesn't materialize, then I not only am I, you know, falling short, but now I have to pay back all these people. Like I got a, you know, so-and-so agent calling me for their commission. Like it's an absolute disaster. And what you see online of like when agents claim that they're selling like, you know, 400 units or a thousand units, they're not, they're co-oping. So essentially 90% of the units that they've sold are units from other agents and maybe a handful, like 10% are their own clients. So that's why it's it's an illusion. Like, and with anybody argues this point, by the way, I will argue it till my face turns blue because I was one of the very first people, successful people in the space. So I can tell you with conviction that this is manifesting. So if you've got number one, a bunch of individual investors that are going to be losing hundreds of thousands of dollars because they uh they're going to walk away from the deposits or their cash flow negative and going to be investing tens of thousands of dollars um uh, to uh to 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 pay private lenders um and to uh, to to sustain excuse me their cash flow negative uh, situation uh and you've got developers that are going to have units that uh, aren't closed on um and uh and are therefore going to have to decide whether they sue the the buyers or whether they um, you know don't do that, but uh, but but try to sell them themselves into a bad um, market. Uh, they've mm -hmm. got the benefit of the deposits, uh, but still the the values are down. Uh, and you've got uh, some that you say might go bankrupt and go into receivership, and and you've got therefore losses uh, at the banks or at least uh, construction loans that aren't paid back as quickly as possible. Um, or as quickly as they were supposed to be. What's going to happen? What's what's the end result of all this? The government has to, you know, somehow step in because it's brewing at the moment. It's brewing. And there are so many indicators, like, you know, how there's like sort of lagging indicators and leading indicators. So some of the leading indicators are things like, assignment boards riddled with people who cannot offload these units they can't close they can't close so what are hundreds if not thousands of people going to do if they can't close so you go to the bank and you're like hi can you lend me a mortgage and the bank goes sure but your unit's not worth 700 it's worth 550 and go find the difference and now you're like okay so everybody's kind of you know trying to figure out what to do. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer because I'm not an economist. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just, I don't know. I don't even think Benjamin Tal knows what to do. I mean, respectfully, cause I think he's a genius. Like we, we are so in dogs doo doo at this point that it's just so difficult a, to analyze, is that a technical you know, term? pardon. Is that a technical term? It could be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're so in dogs doo doo that it's like, we just like there's just so much of it and there's so much corruption in the system as well corruption. And the you haven't mentioned corruption yet what 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 corruption in the system is well there are certain associations that cover up bank fraud right i mean so yeah you're really worried about this mortgage fraud business you think it's a big issue i think well okay let me give you another example TD was just fined 9.2 or 9.6. I know it was in the nines. They were fined $9 million for hiding a money laundering. A bank. A bank. Right? A reputable bank. One of the five major chartered banks. So if TD is fined for money laundering, enough said. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if we're going to these institutions with the premise of, like, you know, safety in our investments and in our deposits and security, et cetera, and they're getting fined for dubious activity, then we should take heed as consumers. Susan, I'm told that uh, this year is going to be the year of the greatest amount of deliveries of condos in greater Toronto history. So, therefore... Everything you've talked about has sort of occurred based on what's happened. And yet more condos are being delivered this year than ever before. 
So it's only going to get worse, right? I, I don't have a crystal ball. That's my answer. I mean, it may, it may not. Who, like if an institution saves the industry, I don't know. As I offer mentioned earlier in the interview, like if, you know, some big players, like some people who sort of have deeper pockets and hedge funds and pension funds and, um, you know, those type of institutions come and they take over, when the construction loans are defaulting, then perhaps they can save some of these condos because they'll convert them into apartment rentals. I can see that manifesting, but I like, I just don't know how sustainable it is, you know, because the thing is, is that if you are an individual and you are absorbing every month, like a thousand dollars, of net flow, net cash flow into your pocket. So it's like 12,000 a year over and over again. Like uh, how sustainable is that in the long haul? Really? It's not. No. And that's the thing. Like if you were a heavy hit and there's going to be larger companies like the Blackstones and whoever else that come in and they secure, you know, all these type of buildings and they just convert them into like, it's, it's pretty much going to be like, you know, we'll see. Um, I hope you're right. We'll see. Yeah. We got to take yeah. a final break and we're going to come back and I'm going to ask, good. I'm going to ask Susan why she thinks it's not going to spread to other sectors because logically it should, at least I think so. Stay with us, everyone back in two minutes for some concluding comments uh, with the condo queen of the greater Toronto area. Stay with us. Oh. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio while we're on Saga 960. I've had a lot of fun today chatting with Susan uh, Tuffline, Tufflein, uh, Ditto. the reputed... Beg pardon? Ditto. You Thank said you. you had a lot of fun. I with said with the, uh, the, the reputed former condo queen. Um, and she's out of the pre-construction condo business now. She's now specializing in laneway houses, which, which I think is kind of interesting. Susan, you had said earlier in the conversation that you didn't think this would spread to other market segments. And I got to ask you why. Uh, you know, we're talking about housing and, and you know, you can live in a, a condo or you can live in a, a townhouse or you can live in a single family or duplex or you can live in a, a single family home. And, uh, and, and one would think that you make those decisions based on how big of a family you've got, how big of a house you want um, and what you can afford. And, uh, I think that a lot of people that might have wanted to have, you know, a single family home were pushed into condos um, because they couldn't afford a single family home. Um, if condo pricing goes down, why wouldn't it have a, a knock on effect in every other sector of the real estate, uh, residential real estate market? Why well, do you think single family homes are insulated because of the holy grail, the way you described it? I don't think they're insulated, but I think they're a safer bet. In other words, so there are certain things that are a bonus when you purchase a detached home versus a condo. There's a lot of regulations surrounding condos. So there's only so many family members you can stick in a like one bedroom or two bedroom unit. Uh, I find a lot of these communities purchase these homes with the premise of sticking like two families, two families into the house. So they literally have like eight people paying down a mortgage. Is that sustainable? I don't know, but that's what it's been for the longest while. So, um, and apart from that, like I really feel like that housing in general, the prices need to come down and they need to taper off. And the reason being is that it's just, it's not affordable. Like if, if you look at it from a price to earnings ratio, you know, it used to be that your income could sustain like 4X or 5X of a home. So you made 100,000 and you could purchase a $500,000, you know, unit or house or whatever. It was sustainable. Now, like it's one to 12. So your 100,000 is paying for a $1.2 million home. It's just, that's just not a sustainable ratio. And that's why everything started to collapse because people, it, it's an income thing. You know, people talk about, Okay, and I'll leave you with it. people talk about demand versus supply. Oh, there was like, oh, supply, demand, supply. Nobody ever factors in affordability. I don't care if you sell 10,000, if you have 10,000 lots available, right? And you only have like three people there. If those three people cannot afford the 10,000 like lots that you're selling, they won't be sold. So we need to look at affordability first and whether or not 
consumers can afford these homes and then talk about demand and then talk about supply. Susan, this has been really interesting. Thank you very much. I really think that, um, you know, it was very interesting uh, last night to have uh, a, uh, a numbers oriented economics, uh, economics oriented uh, um, expert on the housing industry, uh, condo industry. Uh, and then tonight to have someone that practically uh, has sold pre-construction condos and knows sort of the ins and outs of the reality of the marketplace. You've been very helpful in, in so my understanding of the market. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. I hope you're wrong about the coming tsunami, but I happen to think you're right. And I do think that, uh, I don't think the government should bail out, but I do think that that people are gonna have to think about this as, uh, as I do think there's gonna be hundreds if not thousands of people that lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, uh, and that's gonna be a negative impact. And you know, you think about that and how, and even if it's just cash flow negative, because say they close, but it's cash flow negative, that's a lot less money available to buy stuff. And so consumer spending is going to go down. And I think right. this is a, you know, I think it's a real impact. And you take a look at what happened with, you know, you, you mentioned the subprime uh, crisis in the United States. It caused the Great Recession. You know, could what you're talking about cause a, a recession or help contribute to a recession, if not across Canada, you know, in Southern Ontario? Interesting. To, the the, the to last thing about. I just want to say, sorry to interrupt you, is that the crime rate rises, right? When people have less that they can afford and they can barely eat, then they look at, you know, unethical ways to basically secure that type of, you know, money. And so you're going to see the crime rate rise. It's just an inevitable. And that's the thing. If the government does not crack down on this and treat it as, you know, important, it's going to have a rippling effect on other segments of you know the country that's our show for tonight everybody thank you for joining susan real pleasure uh, chatting uh, i remind you i'm on every night at six o'clock on 9 60 a.m you can stream me online at www.saga960m.ca all my podcasts and videos are available on my website briancrombie.com and on social media and on lots of different podcast servers and on youtube as soon as the radio show goes to air good night everybody susan you're awesome appreciate you're it. even more awesome how about that Thank you so much. Good night, everybody.